Once hailed as the harbinger of cheap, clean energy, nuclear power seems to constantly stumble on its path to affordability. The industry, shackled by monumental costs and perpetual delays, now finds itself lagging behind even alternative energy sources. But amidst the gloom, glimmers of hope are starting to emerge in the form of compact, agile nuclear solutions that could fit on the back of a lorry and deliver power straight to your doorstep. But is this the same old story, or is there something truly new here? To comprehend the promise of modular reactors, I want to first grasp the fundamentals of nuclear power in its current predicament. From there, we're going to navigate to innovations poised to rejuvenate the industry and the challenges that they have to surmount. But first, I want to talk about big nuclear reactors and why they suck. To do that, though, I need to start with something a little bit easier nuclear physics. Yes, I've used that joke recently. To nuclear physics 101. Today, we're talking about nuclear fission, the breaking apart of heavy, unstable nuclei to produce energy, not to be confused with nuclear fusion, a technology that also doesn't work yet, but for different set of reasons. The heart of a nuclear power plant is its fission reactor. Most nuclear reactors use enriched uranium as fuel, a material that is surprisingly common in Earth's crust. It is mined, crushed, and leached from the bulk material using sulfuric acid to produce this, known as yellow cake, which is about 80% uranium oxides and is surprisingly cheap, hovering around $200 per kilo, or about 4% the cost of printer ink. However, only about 0.7% of this uranium in yellow cake is isotope uranium-235, which is the most fissile isotope of uranium, meaning it readily undergoes fission when bombarded by neutrons. Enriching uranium involves separating the uranium-235 from the majority uranium-238. These materials, though, only differ by their masses, so the only way to separate them is by a system called gas centrifuging, essentially relying on the fact that heavier things are harder to change the direction of, so if we add material into a spinning system, heavier objects are flung out wider than lighter ones. Now this makes it sound way easier than it actually is. This is the reason that although uranium is everywhere, most countries can't create nuclear weapons of uranium-235 because of how hard and how slow that separation and enrichment process is to actually get right. Conventional reactors typically use low enriched uranium, around 3 to 5% of uranium-235. You can also get high assay low enriched uranium, or HALO, with enrichment levels between 5 and 20%. And I always think it's amazing that just three tablespoons of Halo contains enough energy to provide all of the electricity an individual uses in their entire lifetimes. Once the fuel is enriched, it can be used to produce energy through fission. If a neutron impacts the uranium-235 nucleus, it typically causes the nucleus to split apart, with one possible outcome being barium, krypton, and three more neutrons being produced. The useful part in this process is that these neutrons are emitted at really high speeds. Some of these will hit the surrounding reactor material or coolant, heating it up the same way hitting an object with a hammer heats it up. This now heated coolant can be passed through a heat exchanger to a separate water loop. This causes the water in the secondary loop to boil and turn into steam and can be used to generate electricity in a steam turbine. If, however, the neutrons don't hit the reactor, but instead hit another uranium-235 nuclei, this will cause another fission event, releasing further neutrons that continue the process. There's some really important math that happens here. If one fission event causes exactly one more fission event, the terminology for this is that the reactor has gone critical and will self-sustain its reaction happily producing stable fission energy. If, however, each fission event produces multiple fission events, this is a runaway process. The term is supercritical, and you've made something that's probably more like a bomb than it is an energy generator, which brings us nicely to safety. There are three primary safety mechanisms with many design considerations around each of them. The first are control rods. The simplest way to stop a nuclear reactor is to put a neutron-absorbing metal rod between the uranium fuel bundles. Hey, what is that? It's an inanimate boron rod! These control rods used elements such as boron or cadmium to absorb neutrons without decaying themselves, reducing the neutron count in the reactor vessel and so lowering the fission rate and so the heat output of the reactor. 
which brings us to coolant, which could be water, helium, gas, liquid, or molten salts all pull heat away from the reactor, preventing it from damaging itself, which may compromise other safety systems, and also allowing it to transfer heat into electric power generation systems. Which brings us to useful safety feature number three, moderators, such as light or heavy water or graphite. By slowing down the speed of emitted neutrons, these moderators slightly counterintuitively increase the likelihood that a neutron strikes a uranium-235 isotope. This helps the reactor sustain a chain reaction, or when moderators are removed, fission now occurs less often, cooling the reactor down. The Chernobyl disaster was a bit of a perfect storm of all these three safety systems not performing as expected. The design of the control rods meant the reactor activity briefly increased rather than decreased as they were inserted, causing a jump in power output of the reactor. This power output superheated the water coolant, forming gas bubbles within it. The reactor design had something called a positive void coefficient, meaning that as the gas ratio around the reactor increased to the amount of water that was around it, the reactor's power also increased, leading to an explosion. This explosion ignited the graphite moderator, blasting radioactive materials into the atmosphere landing on the surrounding facility, area, and community. As you can see, there are a lot of things that can go wrong when it comes to nuclear power. So traditionally, when trying to build a nuclear reactor to deliver grid-scale power outputs, the usual approach has been to deliver a large infrastructure project, colossal power stations erected at ultimately staggering costs, epitomized by behemoths like the UK's Sizewell B or the USA's Turkey Point Nuclear Generating Station. But while scale may reign supreme in other domains such as wind and hydro, nuclear at scale presents an interesting problem that has forced it into its own death spiral. Nuclear energy's ascent to dominance has perpetually loomed on the horizon, never quite materialising. Now with the tides of favour shifting away, nuclear power stands at a crossroads, teetering on the brink of obsolescence. What catalyzed this fall from grace, other than all of the explosions? When wind, solar, or really even gas fail, mostly it's a question of a blackout. When nuclear power fails, history has a small littering of events like Chernobyl, Three Mile Island, and Fukushima that have all taught us this fails in a much larger and more concerning way. As a result, this very sensibly produced a cycle of heightened regulatory scrutiny, safety protocols, and other measures not seen to the same extreme in other industries. But this as a result turned building new nuclear plants into an increasingly bureaucratic, political, and costly operation. What I found really interesting is that you can actually see this in the data. Three Mile Island partially melted down on March 28, 1979. This is a plot of the cost of reactor construction organized by construction start date against price, and it shows a stark change. The red circles are reactors that finished before the disaster, and the brown circles are the ones that finished afterwards, where a wave of regulatory compliance and other safety measures ballooned the cost of these facilities. Traditionally though, even with sudden regulatory or safety barriers applied, most markets trend downwards in their costs due to continued innovation, economies of scale, and lowering costs of adoption across marketplaces that they serve. That is, with the fascinating exception of nuclear. While the levelized cost of energy of all other technologies in the energy sector decreased between the years of 2009 to 2019, nuclear managed to increase its cost by 26%. That's a trend that is only out embarrassed by the UK's inability to build new train lines. Part of the problem here is that the large-scale nuclear builds are very difficult to scale. Each construction activity essentially becomes a bespoke project, influenced by particular geographic considerations, like if you put it in a tsunami zone, reactor choice, fuel choice, cooling approach, scale of energy production needed to serve the region, local political hurdles, the list is a long one. Underpinning that problem, though, is that human cooperation doesn't scale well. So complex problem spaces become incredibly bureaucratic activities to solve, racking up time and money. This isn't a problem though in large scale wind, solar, or even gas plants, because largely the individual elements are safe, modular, bought in bulk and combined together, and with the risk well understood and practical to ameliorate. The complexity space, a theoretical 2D plane where most physicists live, of how hard it is to build solutions in these renewable industries remains small and conquerable. However, they aren't the final answer because we will always need reliable sources of preferably clean, baseload power to complement intermittent renewable sources like wind and solar. 
so we need a solution. And we find here a really interesting counter trend that talks to solving this point in nuclear, though the data set is limited, and that is what happened in France. Unlike most countries that diversify their nuclear reactor designs, France limited itself to a small number of standardized reactors by a small number of companies, which it then replicated across multiple sites, often constructing multiple reactors on the same site, allowing for shared resources and streamlining the construction process. Construction costs in France, as a result, have flatlined for the last 30 years, and nuclear now provides 75% of France's energy. And that brings us to a rule common to anyone that builds software, the 90-90 rule. The first 90% of the code accounts for the first 90% of the development time. The remaining 10% of the code accounts for the remaining 90% of the development time. Yes, that adds to 180% time. The point here is how can we move nuclear out of the largely bespoke, highly complex regime of building from scratch to the complexity space that is smaller and easier to conquer, to a more modular, scalable, and cost-efficient approach? This brings us to SMRs, small, modular, nuclear, it didn't get a letter, reactors. The buzz at the moment in the nuclear industry, but are they the golden bullet? Small modular nuclear reactors, as the name implies, are nuclear reactors that are small in size and power output compared to traditional nuclear reactors, typically producing less than 300 megawatts of electricity compared to the 1000 plus megawatts of traditional reactor systems. The design ethos behind an SMR is to move the industry towards manufacturability of reactors in factories rather than on site, allowing for higher degrees of standardization across designs, which should improve safety, quality, and price point. Once transported to site, this should also offer shorter construction times and the possibility of upgrading capacity by bolting on additional reactors as needed. We said though that the key consideration was safety in driving up the regulatory costs associated with nuclear build-outs. There are many different SMR designs coming to market, but I think it's interesting to look at a couple leaders in the pack to see how they reduce size and cost, but retain safety. The hopefully aptly named Ultra Safe Nuclear Corporation, or USNC, sets out their plans more clearly than most, and it's a multi-layered approach to avoiding meltdowns that starts with the fuel. They use an increasingly industry standard approach to fuel sources of enriched uranium encased in millimeter-sized ceramic containers, known as Trezo fuel, which they manufacture in-house. These fuel pellets are about the size of a walnut, but contain the energy of 2,000 litres of diesel each. As fission reactions occur, these shells trap the various radioactive nuclear fission byproducts inside. These spheres are then contained in a silicon carbide matrix which was nearly as hard as diamond, with a melting point of 2,700 degrees Celsius. This prevents many of the failure pathways of traditional fuel designs. If the matrix is somehow broken, the ceramic spheres inside add a second layer of protection to keep the fuel contained. SMRs also generally adopt passive cooling approaches, or negative reactivity feedback systems, that act as fail-safes to prevent nuclear meltdowns in the event of power loss or damage to the facility. USNC still uses control rods, but it's designed so that the reactor becomes less efficient at higher temperatures. Their design also uses helium gas as a coolant, which although is less efficient at cooling, is a noble gas, meaning that it doesn't react or corrode materials and importantly doesn't explode if ignited. As the individual reactors output significantly less power than a large nuclear reactor, around 10 to 45 megawatts, they can be designed so that in the event of loss of cooling or even complete withdrawal of the control rods, they can self-cool just by thermally radiating their energy as heat. The idea is by bolting together many small, easier to make safe modules, an energy generation facility can be produced with the necessary output while operating in a much safer, more reliable, and ultimately cheaper regime. And all of these things I've just said should lead you to believe that USNC seems really compelling, as does the thesis around SMRs in general. But the elephant in the room is, well, we still aren't actually seeing these things enter the marketplace. Why is that? The other commonly heralded SMR company is NuScale, which self-reports to be the global leader, and as of November 2023, they were the only American company with a design approved by regulators. Their 77 megawatt design is conceptually similar to conventional reactors, helping it get to market first, but scaled down and immersed in a pool of water for emergency cooling. But the problem across SMRs is that the price point that they keep on promising seems to creep on upward just like their big nuclear reactor brethren. 
starting with a high but still competitive quote to provide six reactors to Utah at a cost of $55 per megawatt hour in 2016, this drifted slowly up to $58 in 2021 before skyrocketing to $119 in 2023. This made it as expensive as conventional nuclear projects. So after all of that clever engineering and modular design, we seem to have ended up frustratingly exactly where we started. Most recently, the blame for that cost creep has been attributed to inflation and the general rise of costs and material needed in nuclear construction, combined with the difficulty of sourcing advanced nuclear fuels which are typically imported from Russia. Renewables, as you can imagine, haven't faced such extreme price rises, creating further price disparity. In November of 2023, NuScale announced it was terminating its project in Utah, even though the Department of Energy had already approved $1.35 billion over a 10-year period to help subsidize the project. Even with that taxpayer money injection, it failed to deliver on a fair cost of energy, so rightfully, the project was scrapped. Shortly after, X Energy, another reactor developer, called off a $1.8 billion deal to go public, citing challenging market conditions. And Oklo, another reactor designer backed by Sam Altman, had its license application rejected in 2022 by regulators and subsequently lost a contract with the Air Force worth an estimated $100 million in 2023. So fascinatingly, even with this clever narrative and ability to deliver these infrastructure projects in small, modular designs, they still encounter the classic teething problems of large nuclear reactors. Maybe reactor designers just need to think one step even smaller. If removing the majority of bespoke parts required for nuclear was already achieved by SMRs, but the building of projects still lags and spirals out of control, then you might be asking, well, isn't that it then for this industry? But what if we could go one step further? SMR projects like NuScale are still billion dollar builds. The geography, community stakeholders, connection to the existing electrical infrastructure all need development, collaboration, planning and execution. So how do we remove more of these from the equation? What if we could turn up tomorrow with a fully realized nuclear reactor and plug it in where the power was needed? That sounds crazy, but it's exactly what a new class of nuclear called micro nuclear reactors are trying to do. Already, startups such as Nano Nuclear Energy and energy giants like Westinghouse are making the first attempts to develop reactors that drive up to site and are ready to generate power on demand. Nano Nuclear Energy are claiming their entire reactor will be able to fit on the back of a truck. Westinghouse's E. Vinci microreactor will be similar but arrive in pieces on multiple trucks to be assembled and integrated into a grid in less than 30 days. And now it's important to note here straight away that this isn't ridiculous as it might sound. Small nuclear power reactors have been used in nuclear submarines and aircraft carriers for decades. We have just never really seen them crop up in traditional consumer marketplaces. Westinghouse intends to use the same Trezo fuel in their system, but instead of pumping helium through as a coolant, a heat pipe will be used. Heat pipes are long thin tubes that passively transfer thermal energy from one end of the tube to the other. Reducing the number of moving parts means less complexity, less cost, and less maintenance. The whole system is designed to provide continuous power for eight years. After that, it's driven back to the factory for refueling. This removes a huge amount of the build-out required for things like concrete bunkers, control systems, roads, and everything else needed for traditional power stations that don't actually get you generating power, at yes, the expense of maybe don't leave the keys in the ignition. Initial cost estimates are $90 million to $120 million per reactor, with aims at scale to deliver these units for $60 million each. Which yes, this is a different application and produces much less power overall than a full-size SMR site, but the government subsidy alone for new scale project was over a billion dollars. So microreactors move us into comparatively an incredibly low cost to test these sorts of technology capabilities. What I want you to focus on here isn't necessarily these two companies that I've picked, but rather the space in general, and ask ourselves, do these micro nuclear reactors plug a gap that is otherwise very hard to fill? The first indications from the market are currently targeting things like remote mining efforts that are off-grid. I'm not actually sold these are the right play here. To build out a solar farm for this application is around $600,000 per megawatt in the current market. Yes, you also need batteries if you want the mine to operate at night and potentially a larger array as a result, and maybe even backup generators, but your goal isn't to use them if possible. But assuming the mine is going to be operational and in the same place for a while, there's enough accessible land around 
around these installations for solar farms and solar continues to drop in price. A mobile reactor to a static operation at a high cost I'm not sure ultimately wins. Some use cases that I think are maybe more interesting are disaster or emergency response groups. Yes, maybe, but I guess if you're turning up because the existing infrastructure has failed and you're here to turn the lights back on, then you have to hope that the hurricane destroyed just the gas, coal, or other generators and didn't touch the power cables that connect the city. And do you really want to send a nuclear reactor into an already destabilized environment? Maybe not. I think the real application here lands on remote microgrids either islands that don't have space or aren't appropriate for solar or wind, or for communities that are remote, maybe in the northern hemisphere, so receive less sunlight, or maybe even really remote communities. Westinghouse is also launching their Astro Vinci microreactor, providing between 10 kilowatts to 100 kilowatts to address the power needs of on-orbit or lunar surface applications. For moonshot technologies, maybe nuclear does make sense. Because of the long fuel lifetime, practicality of maintaining a self-contained single reactor unit rather than an expansive array of solar panels say that also obviously would stop working for between 1.5 and 3.5 days at a time which is the length of a single night on the moon which would mean that doing something like running off batteries would be even more challenging during that period with all of these applications actually finding the one that works relative to what nuclear can deliver on is very challenging there is also not to help painfully little information about technical progress at the moment in these micro nuclear reactors. Major industry players though, like Westinghouse, are making movements in this area. And I think that really is worth paying attention to, just as everyone else is still trying to speculate, could this actually work? I'm not sure we have an answer yet, but we rarely do prior to these technologies actually taking hold. That's the really hard bit, but also the fun bit when it comes to finding gaps for technologies that simply do not exist yet. Maybe these applications with these form factors and considerations are the key to finally unlocking the future of nuclear energy. What do you think? If you like this video, I got a super cool opportunity to visit First Light Fusion last year who are making an amazing approach to nuclear fusion technologies, essentially hitting a fusion fuel with a projectile going 60 kilometers per second so that it implodes faster than it has time to explode. Go check it out wherever I've left the link, probably down in the description down below. Leave me a comment with what you think about modular or micro nuclear reactors. There is tons that I didn't get time to cover off, all of which I'm really interested in as I start to learn about this space. What if someone steals the thing? That would be a nightmare. As always, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next week. Goodbye.